I saw the mantra on your website is rise to your purpose because life is way too short to live without purpose. So as you know, a big piece of what we do at FRC is helping people identify their massively transformative purpose. So I was hoping maybe you would share your massively transformative purpose with us uh, and, and tell, tell us a little bit about how that plays a role in your work. Yes, well, Miles Monroe, great preacher, uh, he's passed now, but he, he had a statement that said, he, he made the statement saying, the greatest tragedy of life is not death, but rather it's a life without a purpose. Mm -hmm. So that's the greatest tragedy. And even at 10 years old, I felt emptiness because I felt like there was something I needed to be doing to make life better for people. And I wept, I would weep about that because I, I, I cried about the conditions that we lived in versus the conditions that I saw on television, how things were so different on television than they were in my, in my life. And so when you don't have purpose, you wander around trying to find something that's meaningful, something to attach to that's meaningful so that you can feel like you, you're alive or you, you're here for a reason. So my always been, uh, as far as I can remember back, is wanting to solve a world problem. But as I was moving into the, the high flow leadership institute trainings, I had my mind had started going going toward love. How that if we are going to regain mastery over life, my whole thing is help people regain mastery over life, so that we can solve all kinds of problems that we face and not find ourselves hiding in caves trying to you know ignore the problems, but actually come out and, and deal with the problems. Uh, I was watching this movie uh, sometime back with. Anthony Hopkins, and I can't remember the name of it, Richard Gere, but it was a bear that was chasing them. And the bear was <laughs> trying to kill him, right? And so Richard Gere was like, oh, what are we going to do? This, this bear is going to kill us. He's not going to stop chasing us to be kill us. Kill us. And Anthony Hopkins said, no, we got to kill the bear. <laughs> he said, we got to kill the bear. He said, kill the bear? How can we kill the bear? Right? Really? <laughs> well, that's, that's the way I see that it, with purpose is that we have to deal with the challenges in front of us, not hide from them, not ignore them. So regaining mastery over life um, really requires that we go to a, what some people call a highest emotion, but I'm going to say the most sacred value. Because I think that when we start talking about selfless love, because that's what we're, I'm talking about, really using love to help guide us to solve these problems is more than an uh, emotion. Love is an emotion like romantic love or lust or long-term love, which Helen Fisher calls attachment, is more than that. It's a sacred value. It's a value in our heart that we love people, that we love each other, because we realize, I realize that I am one with everything. I'm mm -hmm. one with the bugs. I'm one with the evil man down the street. I'm one with the good man on the other end of the street. I'm everybody and everything. So I need to, I have to bring myself up to a level to be able to love everybody in every situation that I'm in. I don't weep when I go through hard trials. I just understand that they're part of me, the journey for me to get where I need to go. So I'm not afraid to be face to face with uh, some type of confrontation. Well, a lot of people don't want confrontation. I have no problem with it because I realize I have somewhere to be. I have an appointment and I got to get there. And that appointment is to help people remember how to use the power of love to solve all kinds of persistent problems. And I think, you know, you... One of, one of the many amazing things about you is that you have such clarity on this purpose. And it, you know, if you look at your, your journey professionally, you can see that purpose show up time and time again. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, how this purpose has evolved and how it's helped you with how that clarity has really helped you just consistently overcome obstacles? Right. And like I say, the, one of the probably biggest obstacles to, was for me was my teaching, the mm. way I perceived, perceived the teaching, what it meant in the church in those 40 years. And I'm still a part of the church. I love the church. But I realized that if we are going to succeed and fulfill the purposes of God, we got to live according to the word of God. We can't make up stuff. Okay. 
You can't have traditions talking about this is it. That's not it, okay? So, <laughs> so I'm not afraid to speak out about it. And for some people, that's they get uncomfortable. So the, going through these challenges, one of the things that I, I can really point to is when I ran for office. When I first ran for mayor of the city of Chicago, you probably don't know about that, but I ran for the mayor of the city of Chicago before I ran for the Senate. And I ran for mayor because I felt that this is one of the biggest races that was going on. It was a, the world was watching it because Chicago is a big, it's a world city, basically. And all of the candidates were talking about making Chicago, you know, taking Chicago to the next level and achieving these great things with Chicago and all that. Nobody was talking about the challenges of everyday people, the struggle that people had that when their kids couldn't go out to play, where three of the high schools, like in my district, three of the high schools in my district have 80%, 100% chronic truancy. Kids don't want to go there because they're afraid and they can't play outside. They can't take a walk. I mean, we have food deserts. To me, if we're talking about bringing Chicago up, we need to be bringing the whole city up and not ignore the fact that we have a group, a large percentage of Chicago that is suffering in a different, living in a different world than everybody else is in Chicago. It's a tale of two cities. So I ran to carry that voice into, into the marketplace. And so that's what gave me the, the strength to do it because who runs the, the race and nobody knows you, right? You're running for mayor and I'm in a race with all these famous people, all, all these famous people are in the race and then, and Patricia. And quite naturally, <laughs> my people would be like, what are you doing? Who are you? You know, because it's like, we know you. You're not the mayor, okay? So, but I felt I had to because people needed to hear their voices out there in the, in the, in the discussion about improving Chicago and improving the world. And, and I didn't win that race, thank God. I didn't, I, I didn't shouldn't be the mayor anyway. It's too much work. Uh, I, I, get, I pray for the mayor all the time. <laughs> but I, the next day, my senator quit. And because I had such name recognition, 66% name recognition at that point, when my senator quit, people wanted me to be the senator. And even though the Democratic Party appointed a different person, I just waited a year and I ran against her and I was able to beat her about 12 points, 12 points total in one, one area, eight points in the other side. So I got, was able to really just win that race by a landslide. And that was because people heard my voice that I was carrying their voices. I wasn't talking about my dreams of my vision. I was talking about their dreams, their visions, their hopes for their families. That is what I'm calling the neurobiology of love, which is what mm. I'm, I'm teaching on now. It's about how you can use the power of the neurobiology of love to really help people see uh, and feel you and give you also give you access to information that you otherwise wouldn't have if you hadn't opened yourself up to love. Now, for some people, that's very painful, painful thought to think that you know, I'm going to love everybody. <laughs> but for me, I've learned that it's the most valuable feeling I can have is to love every single person. And so because of that, I was able to work with transsexual people. That was something I would never have been able to work with transsexual people. You know, I was able to work with Muslims. I work with atheists, people from all walks of life, all ethnicities, because all of them are me and I am all of them. And I recognize that and I love me and I love them. So. That's how, I've been, that's how I've been able to operate in all these spaces. And even when we get down to the Senate, there are votes that people said, I know you're not going to vote yes on that, you know, because that's not, that's an abortion. Uh, be, having been able to have an abortion, being able to uh, have uh, for a child to be able to get an abortion, all these things like this, they think that I shouldn't vote on it, but I vote on it because I don't represent these people as a preacher. I'm not their preacher because if I was their preacher, they could come to church. I'm their representative. So I carry their voices into government. So it's not my will, it's their will that I carry. And if I would come to a point where I feel like I can't carry their voices, then it's time for me to resign because that's what they elected me for, to carry their voices into government. If what you've heard on Flow Research Collective Radio has been helpful, please consider doing us a solid and leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this. Reviews help us connect to a wider audience so we can get these peak performance principles out to more people. Music